Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another video in our Intro to African History series. This is Pan-African Lectures, and I'm your host, as always, Dr. Shingi Mavima. Uh, today we are talking about the development of colonialism in the 20th century, its growth and its, its uh, evolution, uh, its establishment, and, and as well as the resistance that, that continued throughout it. In the past few weeks, we've spoken about the scramble for Africa. We've spoken about some of the 19th century resistances. Um, you know, we've spoken about the Abushiri revolt in Tanzania. We've spoken about these different things. Um, the the Anglo-Zulu wars, uh, the last of the frontier wars between the, the whites and the Tosa in South Africa. Uh, the Gaza resistance. We've spoken about the Shona and Debele uprisings in Zimbabwe. So we're continuing on that tip, just that now we are into the 20th century. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get right into it. And if you haven't already, make sure you like the video, subscribe, share it, tell somebody to tell somebody to tell somebody so we can uh, continue to have this conversation. This is the intro to history series. Like I said, uh, I'll be putting, I'll be starting other videos in a, in, a, in a few weeks that are more in depth and more specialized based on my own scholarship. Um, but for now, this is an intro to African history. So this is a great place to start with these conversations. And as I always, I'll put some of my sources in the description. So without further ado, um, let's, uh, let's get started here. And like I said, we're talking about colonialism in the early 20th century. We are cooking with gas and I will see you guys at the end of the video. All right. So we touched on this earlier when we spoke about the, the scramble for Africa in which I explained that there were four main types of colonial rule. And these four types are as goes. The first one was the economic companies. The economic companies were a staple of the early years of colonialism, in which European nations allowed these companies that were granted large territories to administrate in Africa. Um, these companies were formed by, by businessmen who were, their focus was on exploiting the, the natural resources of the territories they were allowed to govern. Uh, we've already seen the, the Sierra Leone company uh, at the turn of the, of the 19th century than others such as the British South African Company owned by Cecil John Rhodes, which came after the British East African Company, uh, among others. The companies could set up their own systems of taxation and labor recruitment. And for their part, the European powers who provided uh, charters to these companies took responsibilities for all the expenses related to establishing and administering the colonies. So this was a good deal for them because they had the political benefit of having additional colonies in Africa, but not the expense. So, 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 so that's sort of the, the, the catch, right? The, the give and take. You are allowed to have your company set up shop in, in Rhodesia, in South Africa, in Kenya, uh, in, this, in these places, and you exploit its resources and its people, right? but you're offered the political protection of, of, the, of the British Empire or the German Empire at the time. Uh, these companies were eventually unsuccessful in that they were unable to generate consistent profits for their shareholders. Uh, governing a colony is very expensive and the companies faced opposition from Africans, from the different African groups. Uh, the missionaries, once the missionaries started to speak up as well, even though we've seen that, for example, with Reverend Charles Helm, who worked with the British South African company and Sister John Rose and them to trick Lobengula into signing over the country. We've also seen that some of the missionaries, although they were agents of the empire, they had they came through with bleeding hearts and so they condemned some of the practices of the economic companies, which is why the economic companies didn't last too long. And by 1924, all company rule was replaced by various forms of European colonial government governance, which includes this. Uh, direct rule, that's the second type of colonial rule there was, right? And this was synonymous with the French 
the Belgians, the Portuguese, the Germans. So it was a very common colonial uh, system of colonial rule. Um, it, uh, it constituted of centralized administrations, usually in urban centers that stress policies of assimilation. Uh, these, uh, the, the, what this means then is the colonialists had the intention of quote unquote civilizing African societies so that they became more like Europe. As part of their strategy, colonialists did not try to negotiate governance with indigenous African rulers and governments or indigenous, indigenous authorities were, were undoubtedly subordinate in the system of direct rule. Um, so what does this mean? What this means is there was a spectrum through which the more civilized, educated, Christianized you got, you were regarded as being more European. That's why in Portugal, we talk of the assimilados. In, in the Portuguese empire, we talk about what we call the assimilados. In, in the French uh, colonies, we, spoke, we talk about what we call the evolué, which is the evolved ones. These are Africans who were on their path to becoming more European. There was no regard for, for existent structures of rule and, and these things. And uh, to this day, you know, part of the, the, the things that you will notice, and I've explained this in a previous video, is to the extent that French as a language is so ingrained in Francophone countries, Francophone African countries, in a way that English, which, is, uh, which had a system of indirect rule, which we will talk about shortly, is not necessarily ingrained. Um, and that is to say, culturally, what do I mean by that? So, for example, many English speak or oh, Africans from uh, from Anglophone countries are pretty articulate in English, but a lot of them are also not. Whereas, and this may be anecdotal, I'm I have hardly met any Africans from Francophone countries who are not at native level proficiency of French. That's how, and the, the, a large part of that is it's a legacy. Of this, of this tradition of, of direct rule in which the, the colonies were an extension of, of greater France, if you will, or what they called it. So, uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the 20th century. That's, that was what direct rule was. Indirect rule was something that is, was synonymous with the British. This system of governance used indigenous African rulers within their communal administration, although they often maintained an inferior role. So the chiefs and, 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 and traditional kings were still utilized, right? Albeit inferior and in a very manipulated role that served the British. Um, overall, it was a more cooperative model than direct rule. The system of governance assumed that all Africans were organized as tribes, quote unquote, with chiefs. Um, so, so that is where, where it falls short of respecting these traditions because not all systems had, had tri were based along tribal lines and, and chiefs, right? If you look at that, that, that pre-colonial history, but they just assumed it that way. So a lot of the chiefs were maybe influential people in their community prior, but they were now posited as chiefs in a way that disrupted traditional life. But that, that's indirect through, um, you know, which was, you know, the way in which Ghana and Nigeria were, 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 were governed and, and these other African colonies that were not settler colonies, which is the next category we're talking about. So the idea was, was not so much to make these African people British in the way that the direct rule would have for the French and the, and the Belgians and the Portuguese, um, but it was a way of just making sure that we are able to extract all the resources that we can from them orbit without totally disrupting their structures of life. The final rule is known as settler colonial rule or, 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 or settler rule, which refers to the type of colonialism in Southern Africa, right? South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, these places, in which European settlers imposed direct rule on their colonies. The settler colonies differed from other colonies in Africa and that a significant number of immigrants from Europe settled in this colony. So you get people like uh, in South Africa, which today maintains a large white population in the millions. Zimbabwe as well, uh, at the time Rhodesia, uh, 
had uh, several hundred thousands. You know, the number has dwindled over the years of the post-colonial era. Um, Namibia as well, a uh, significant white uh, population. Then you go to Algeria in North Africa where there were three million French people settled there at the time of the Algerian Revolution. So, and that is important. A lot of people don't think about this when they think about uh, colonialism. Uh, in other parts of Africa, it was, these parts were governed by these European powers by proxy. They set up administration centers and maybe, maybe uh, ha had troops. But in some places, the, 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 the Europeans actually settled in these countries. And that is what is known as settler colonialism. Um, and like I said, these were found primarily in Southern Africa, including the colonies of South Africa, Southern and Northern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe and Mozambique, um, Angola, Mozambique, uh, sorry, uh, Southern and Northern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe and Zambia, of course, um, Southwest Africa, Namibia, uh, as well as uh, Kenya, and Algeria, which we've already spoken about. So these are, these are the more four main types of colonial rule. A particularly interesting case as we go into, into the 20th century, and this is something we've spoken about, we spoke about it when we spoke about the scramble for Africa and, the, and, and in subsequent chapters, uh, when, we talk of, when we talked about uh, Tipu Tip and, 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 and his resistance to, uh, to the settlement of, the, of, uh, of King Leopold and the, and, the, and the Congo Free State. So the Congo Free State, as we've already established, was given to King Leopold as a result of the Berlin Conference as his personal property. Now the property of Belgium, of the Belgian Empire, which of which he was uh, of which he was sovereign, but the pri his private property, right? It was his private. It belonged to him. And for context, the Congo Free State, which is the modern day Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly known as Zaire, is two million square kilometers. It is the second biggest African country in in in, in terms of space only behind Algeria. It is one fourth or thereabouts the size of the USA. So this is a gigantic space, right? It's a gigantic space also with the, one of the largest populations on the continent and one of the most resource rich territories. So, and it just belonged to him, right? It just belonged to the king. Um, so what he would do is he would grant different companies rights to do business in the country in exchange for them building infrastructure, you know, for example. Um, so companies such as the, the Katanga Company, or it was one such company that came in and settled and, 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 and had its way with the resources of, of, of the country while they would, you know, build railways and other such things. Um, the main product at the time was rubber. That was the, the big thing that was being produced in, uh, in, 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 in the Congo Free State. So that was the main resource that they were extracting. And there was a boom around the world, um, primarily because of the advent of the automobile and bicycle industries. So rubber was, was a big deal at the time. Um, and it didn't subside until, you know, between 1905 and 1910, which we'll talk about shortly. So the, the Congo Free State, even though colonialism across the board was a very brutal process, the Congo Free State is renowned for its brutality, renowned for its brutality. And I wanna take this moment to just plug a book that may be of interest for you. If you can find a book called King Leopold's Ghost, I'll put a link to, to it, to, to, to it in, in, in the description section on Amazon or something, because I think it's a great book for any sort of armchair historian of, of, of Africa. And if you really want to know more about the Congo Free State and these brutalities and the way in which it developed, it's a fantastic book to read. But it was renowned for its brutality because the companies had no regard for 
for for human life and for 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 rights or anything like that. So even the king himself obviously did not care. So it, it even by the brutal standards of colonialism, the Congo Free State was particularly brutal. And the companies would use some of the people who had been enslaved by the likes of Tipu Tip as their armies and what proceeded was just a very, very ruthless way of doing business. One of the, um, let me see here if I can find a quote real quick that describes some of the conditions in these spaces. This is from 1895, from an American missionary working in the, in the Congo, Reverend J.B. Murphy, who says, describing the system, it has reduced the people to a state of utter despair. Each town in the district is forced to bring a certain quantity of rubber to the headquarters of the commissar every Sunday. The soldiers, right, the, the ex-slaves were now as the armies, drive the people into the bush. If they will not go, they are shot down and their left hands cut off and taken as trophies to the commissar. These hands, the hands of men, women, and children, are placed in rows before the commissar who counts them to see that the soldiers have not wasted their cartridges. The commissar is paid a commission about one dollar a pound upon all the rubber he gets. It is therefore to his interest to get as much as he can. Let me give an incident to show how this unrighteous trade affects the people. One day, a, a state corporal who was in charge of a post at Lolifa was going around town collecting rubber. Meeting a poor woman whose husband was away fishing, he said, where is your husband? He then said, where is your rubber? She answered, it is ready for you. Whereupon he said, you lie and shot her dead. Shortly afterwards, the husband returned and was told of the murder of his wife. The wretched man then raised his gun and killed the corporal. The soldiers went away to the headquarters of the state and made representations, misrepresentations of the case with the, with the result that the commissar sent a large force to support the authority of the soldiers. The town was looted, burned, and many people killed and wounded. In November of 1894, there was heavy fighting upon the Bosira because the people refused to give rubber. I was told by, upon the authority of the state officer that no fewer than 18, 1,890 people were killed. So very, very brutal system. And at the point, <clears throat> there was little concern from Europe, from the rest of the world around us, right? Uh, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century. <clears throat> there was little concern. A large part of it is because uh, at the agreement of the Berlin Conference really sort of granted the king some sovereignty in this area. Also, the other countries had free navigation, as we've discussed before, in the, in the waterways of the empire, uh, I mean, of the, of the Congo Free State. So folks were not really that concerned. And again, these African bodies were largely considered to be, you know, to be spoils of war, right? However, the Congo Free State would collapse by 1908, as due to the work of missionaries and other people starting to spread this word, there was growing international condemnation of the activities uh, at the, uh, of, the, of the Congo, of King Leopold and the Congo Free State companies and the police, uh, uh, policing uh, system. The other reason why it collapsed is because there was uh, growing armed resistance as many African people, as we've already seen that they started resisting, but they started going out to the, to the eastern coast of, 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 of Africa, the Swahili coast, Tanzania and the likes and getting armed. So they were starting to put up armed resistance as well as the, as the Africans. So the Africans never took this lying down. Then finally, falling rubber prices made it unsustainable for some of these companies to maintain their space within the Congo Free State. Uh, prices were falling in large part due to, <clears throat> uh, were falling in large part due to the discovery of uh, the, 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 the discovery of, not the discovery, the, the introduction, if you will, of plantations in, in Asia, in, in, in countries like um, 
Indonesia and the Philippines and the likes. So it, it wasn't as profitable as them. You know, bear in mind, this was a very brutal system and the companies are include, uh, very interested in, in just the bottom line. So after that, they, the, the, you know, the, the Congo Free State as we knew it succumbed and became the property of the Belgian Empire at this point, just being the sole property of King Leopold himself. But uh, it became the pro it became part of the Belgian Empire and changed its name to the Belgian Congo, the Belgian Congo, which would be its name for the most part throughout the throughout the colonial era, throughout the twentieth century. Now. In West Africa, right, we're back to talking about West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, these spaces. Um, what is interesting about this, because remember, these were not the settler colonies, but they had a, a, between direct rule in the French colonies and indirect rule in the, in the British colonies. But the West, West Africa provides an insight into the way in which Africans maintained agency and initiative even at the height of the colonial era, right? And one of the ways that you see that is, even though there was a lot of pillaging by the, by, by, by the Europeans and this attempt to assert themselves, to continue to assert themselves uh, in, in a way that they had done through the, the slave trade, they ended up finding out that it was actually more profitable to leave the raw material production in the hands of the peasant farmers, right? They quickly found this to be more, to, the, the Africans to be more efficient producers of the, 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 of, of these, of, of these raw materials than the plant, European plantation owners, right? Because for two reasons. One, the Africans were very, very familiar with the space and, and what products grow there and, and the best farming practices. That's one. The second thing is forced labor is very, is notoriously inefficient, right? And which is why after, which is why even the, 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 the institution of slavery as we knew it uh, ended up dying out once more efficient ways were discovered, right? This wasn't a Damascus Road moment where people just got better characters all of a sudden. But we've spoken about that in previous weeks. So what they did, the Europeans did is, for the most part in West Africa, they, they left them, the, the Europeans left the, uh, the, the Africans in their colonies alone and encouraged, quote unquote, them to turn away from food crops and produce ca cash crops for the European markets. So, and the way they made sure that this encouragement worked was the Africans were heavily taxed by the colonial masters. So, which means they had to move away from products that maybe they needed themselves um, and make things like cotton and, 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 and such and palm oil that would be beneficial to the, to, to, to the market, to the European and global market because they knew that they would be taxed heavily and if they made things that were not as profitable, then they would suffer as, as, as a means of that. Uh, palm oil remained, uh, we've spoken about palm oil already, but it remained uh, uh, the, the main export out of, out, out of Igbo land while uh, the production of groundnuts in Senegal also expanded. Um, but just to show the impact that colonialism had, even as palm oil remained the main Igbo land export, it just never reached the level of pre, of its pre-conquest, of its pre-colonial production, right? Because again, people were being forced into this thing and the interruption of industry by, by, by the European colonialists. Now, cocoa, cocoa butter, which is again synonymous with Ghana, in particular, and West Africa in general to this day, is a very important example that shows these ideas of African agency in this space. Now, cocoa is not even originally from Ghana. It was brought in by a, by a metal worker from 
uh, who from Guinea, who who brought it in 1879, who brought it to Ghana in 1879. Then he set up a, a nursery, and by 1890s was selling cocoa seedling, uh, seeds, seedlings by the thousand to local pairs and farmers. Now the British governor sold this, and they set up a, a, a similar thing, you know, just hoping to exploit it. But the credit for the rapid spread of inland cocoa plantations lay firmly in the hands of local pairs and farmers. These, farm, these local farmers would buy land from the local Akan chiefs and develop a thriving peasant operated cocoa plantation system. By 1914, Gold Coast had become the world's largest single producer of cocoa. Apart from the payment of taxes, cocoa farmers spend their earnings on important manufactured goods, the local building of houses, right, roads, bridges, and the education of the children in the mission schools. None of these facilities were provided by the colonial government. And this will become key in a week or two when I do uh, my discussion on the balance sheet of colonialism, the pros and cons of colonialism. Remember this particular point I'm making right now, that none of these things that the, the, they built for their communities were provided for by the colonial government. It was all as a result of their own enterprise and with cocoa and establishing a whole industry around it. <clears throat> now, let's talk a little bit about the rebellions in the German colonies. What territories did the Germans have after the scramble for Africa? Well, prominently among them were in West Africa, Togo and Cameroon, in East Africa, they had uh, uh, German East Africa, which is modern day Tanzania. Okay. In, then they had German uh, um, Southwest Africa, which is a modern day Namibia. So this is some of the spaces that they had. We've already seen some of the resistance to German colonialism at the, at the, in, the, in the end of the 19th century. The Abushiri revolt of 1888, and the Hehe -He resistance, uh, which was led by Mkawa, who committed suicide in 1898 uh, uh, to avoid being captured. But with the defeat of those two uh, resistance movements and others, colonialism was in full effect by the end of the 19th century going into the 20th century. This right now we are talking about that's in both places that we're talking about right now, German East Africa and German Southwest Africa. Um, so, but in 1898, in German East Africa, modern day Tanzania, an adult tax, an adult or adult head tax was put in place, right? Which uh, meant that whether you were working or not, every adult had to pay tax which is not only, it's a very unfair sort of system, right? Because, you know, a lot of people were not working, but, they, but then they would, that would force them into, in, into enslavement and into, into arrest if they, were, if, they were, if they were not able to pay their, their, their head tax. So, and it was also very violently uh, enforced with the cops, very brutal. In, 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 in seeking payments from, from these adults. As time moved on, right, as time moved on, the, in, by 1905, the people were frustrated. And what occurred then is something that is referred today as the Maji Maji Rebellion, the Maji Maji Rebellion. And let's talk about the Maji Maji Rebellion real quick. The local people, remember I've already said that the, the, one of the defining features of the colonial, uh, um, colonial authorities was forcing people, the local African people, to grow goods that they maybe did not need themselves. So local people in, in Tanzania were forced to grow cotton for export and they revolted against this. And this revolt spreads rapidly throughout the region 
with attacks on all foreigners, missionaries, administrators, and the, and, and the, and the Swahili people that, that even, that were local people that represented the, the colonial, uh, colonial authorities. You know, even though on the surface it looks like it was spontaneous, uh, the people of Southern Tanzania came together in a way that is unique in the history of African resistance to colonialism. So what they did was they turned to their beliefs in the powers of the, of the spiritual world. And the particular thing was, what they decided was they sprinkled their bodies with magic water known as the Maji Maji, that's where the name comes from, which they believed would turn the bullets of their enemies into water. It was a simple device and one which brought the people together. So the people sprinkle themselves and they begin to rally, right? Their confidence is through the roof, feel uh, touched by the ancestors and by the, by the spirit world. Um, the Germans were amazed by how quickly this spread and the initial success of, 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 of the quote unquote rebels, right? But the turning point came at the end of only four weeks armed with nothing but spears, and that's them depicted here, with nothing but spears, and the Maji Maji, the, the, the Africans stormed the German machine gun post only to be gunned down, more down by in their thousands, right? In their thousands. So it was not a positive outcome ultimately. However, there were some positive results as well. One of which was, it showed that the, that the Africans could come together and, and unite for a long time. At this point, it was just assumed that uh, tribalism, ethnic differences between the different African groups meant they could never come together to resist colonialism. This was one of the earliest times that we saw different African groups in Tanzania, in Germany, East Africa, come together in the resistance to colonialism. So that was one, and it would be a, something that would have repercussions for the rest of the continent as, as the anti-colonial movement uh, grew throughout the 20th century. The other result of this was, um, was that the Germans were slightly less violent in the treatment of the, of the colonized Africans, just slightly uh, because they, they feared that another uprising would occur. And, and the, the German employers also had to treat their workers a little bit better um, again, these are not huge gains. These are not Damascus Road moments that change everything, but it's, 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 there are some gains of the, of the movement. To the west, to the southwest, uh, we see what we call the Herero Nama uprising. We have already seen, we spoke last week about how the Nama led by the Vidboy, the Nama and the Herero are the two main um, ethnic groups in this, in, the, in, this, in this space of modern day Namibia. Um, the Nama led by Vidboy, the Nama and the Herero had historically had conflict, historically had conflict. But, so when, they, when the Germans first came in, the Herero sought their protection and Nama led by Vidboy had warned the Herero that, you know, you and I, we've had our problems, but this is African stuff. Right, this idea of you seeking protection from these white men is only gonna lead to you're gonna regret it. Even if you defeat me today, you're gonna live to regret it. And true to his word, both the Nama and the Herero were enti entirely under the thumbs of the Germans by the 20th, by the beginning of the 20th century. In 1904, the very Herero who had sought the protection of the Germans earlier decide to. To, to rise up against, against the Germans um, due to what they, they saw, of course, was, was their brutality and the fact that more and more Germans have been coming in to, 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 to the space and, um, and thereby disenfranchising and, and, and uh, the, the, the Herero more and more as time went on. So they decided to stage an uprising. In 1904, they rose up and killed over 100 German traders and settlers and reoccupied much of their former territory. Oh, this is important. In 1897 and 1898, there'd been a rinderpest blight 
that's uh, a disease that that kills off the, that kills off cattle, and the Germans have used advantage of that because a lot of that cattle was Nama and Herero to clear territory and start to claim it for themselves. So they were starting to flood it with with other German uh, colonial immigrants, if you will, who were coming to Namibia. So this is what the the, the Herero were in reaction to. So they killed these hundred traders and settlers, and reclaimed much of their ter or former territory. However, because of that conflict, that, that the historic conflict that they, they, they had with the, with the Nama, they did not, were not able to get them to back their uprising, which will prove to be deadly. Um, so it was too late by them, too late by them to, to get the Nama to join them. So they did it themselves, killed, killed 100 Germans, at which point, the German commander in chief in 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 Namibia, German West Africa, the Southwest Africa, um, commanded the troops to circle up the, the 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 territory in which the Herero lived, and announce these words: "The Herero are no longer German subjects; they have murdered and plundered. The Herero nation must leave the country." Very much as their country, right? If it will not do so, I shall compel it by force. Inside German territory, every Herero tribesman, armed or unarmed, with or without cattle, will be shot. No women and children will be allowed in the territory. They will be driven back to their people or fired on. These are the last words of the Herero nation from me, the great general of the mighty German empire. And boy, did he live up to his word, massacred. There was a population of about 80,000 Herero prior to that. Only 16,000 remained. 80% of the Herero people were killed in that moment, right? In that moment. And eventually, 2,000 of them left and moved to Bechuana land, the, the British protectorate of Bechuana land. Which is modern day Botswana. So it was, it was a massacre. The Nama separately ended up rising up as well the following year, and were slaughtered as well. With a vid boy killed in 1905, the leader of the Nama, the famed leader of the Nama. He was older by then, but he was also killed. And by 1907, they, the Germans were in full control. You know, it called the uprisings. However. Uh, by the outbreak of the First World F War by 1914-1915, uh, hatred of the German of German rule had become so intense that some of the Southern Nama, you know, welcomed South African invasion in the early months of 1915. Right, this devil may very well be better than our own devil, um, which, which was our assumption at the time, and we'll see how that plays out when, as, as we proceed to the 20th century. Typically, when we talk about the world wars, both of them, and uh, yeah, when we talk about the, the, the world wars, it seems that they are called the world war, but we don't really see an African presence in them, right? And to an extent, you get it. And I was just having a debate with somebody on social media about this who claimed that, you know, how dare they call it a world war when it, when it was just a European war, right? Um, but the flip side of that is if they were called to call it a European war or a Western war, it would also be very, it would be, it would be erasing the important role played by other non-Europeans or non-Western groups, right? Uh, which famously, of course, include the likes of Japan. But also it is very important to recognize that Africa was very much involved in both world wars, and today we are talking about Africa's involvement in the First World War. The first way in which Africa was obviously involved was there were particular arenas. Uh, you know, the world, First World War was fought significantly on the African continent as well as other places, right? That's, that's one. So you have Territories such as Togo, right, which uh, belong to, to Germany, 
uh, the, 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 that one was conquered pretty easily and this is why Togo, we remember it now as a French colony and not a German one because it was taken over uh, by, in, in the war by the French uh, away from the Germany. Uh, Cameroon was a lot more problematic. Uh, there, there was much more fighting there and eventually it was taken over by the French as well as well as parts of it taken by the British from the, from the, from the French. Um, I mean, from the Germans. German East Africa, which we were just talking about, was, was another prominent site in which, um, another prominent place on the continent in which, in which the war was fought. The, the pro, it was the quote unquote property of Germany, but it was eventually taken over by the British, who, by the way, as we'll talk a little bit later, uh, were able to do so with the support of tens of thousands of African troops brought over from their colonies in Nigeria and Ghana and Sierra Leone. So Africans were also very involved in, in actually fighting in these spaces. Um, South Africa, uh, South Africa, uh, even as a colonial government, allied with the British in fighting in Germany, East Africa. Then, as we just mentioned on the previous slide, South Africa defeated German forces in German Southwest Africa in 1915. This is what we were talking about when the Nama and other Namibians readily accepted them just based on their hatred for the brutal German forces. So you see the war is actually happening in several African parts, right? Also bear in mind that a lot of, uh, a lot of the the supplies used in the war, not only was it fought on African ground, a lot of the supplies used in the war had come from Africa, which included um, the British claiming um, Egyptian corn, cotton, camels, labor, which were all using the fight against the Ottoman Empire during the World War, right? So. So you see that not just the African space, but African products were used um, in, the, in the First World War as well. But most importantly, however, is this idea of the actual African people who fought in the war, okay? The actual African people who fought in the war. For example, we see here that more than one million porters were recruited from Kenya and Tanzania to fight on behalf of the British. Uh, the porters are, are baggage handlers and other people will carry the stuff for, 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 for the militants. One million, right? With, hun with uh, hundreds, at least 100,000 of them, at least a tenth of them died from disease, malnutrition and overwork, okay? 50,000 West Africans were brought in, as I explained earlier from Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, these British uh, colonies in West Africa to fight in German East Africa. I mean, to fight in, yeah, German East Africa and modern day Tanzania. So 50,000 West Africans fought in, in, in East Africa. 600,000 Francophone Africans were, were brought in to fight as well, with 150,000 of them actually serving in the trenches in, in Europe, on the European Western Front and 30,000 of them were killed as a result of that. Um, and a further 40,000 African troops were killed fighting for France in the Mediterranean. So again, these are stark numbers, right? That you see that this wasn't a, a, a minor involvement in the war. This was a major involvement in the war. Um, the French also had 140,000 laborers from North Africa who served in the war. So again, but if you're doing the math, we are probably up to a few million Africans who are involved in this. Um, so these are some of the prominent ways in which Africa was, was, uh, was involved in the war. And this picture here is uh, from, um, you know, my home country, uh, Zimbabwe, at the time Rhodesia. And this is a Rhodesian regiment right here, right? This is a Rhodesian regiment uh, marching through Salisbury, which is the capital. Uh, Harare today, bound for East Africa during the First World War. So these were also troops recruited from Rhodesia that went on to fight in um, in in East Africa. 
I also just want to mention this here, you know, this is a very interesting anecdote through which South Africa recruited so many troops to fight on their behalf, right, from, 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 from South Africa. Well, they recruited them to, 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 to join the, the, the forces uh, to fight against the Germans. However, they would not allow the African people to carry rifles. You know why? Because they believed that it would set a bad precedent if these African people started shooting at white people. So it doesn't matter that the white people that they were shooting at were the South African government's enemies. It, it just wouldn't be right for black people to shoot at, 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 at Europeans because they felt that that would be involved in their resolve and they would come back and do the same thing back in South Africa. Uh, and the same mentality was used as well with, uh, with the, when the British people and, and other people, uh, conscripted people to fight in Europe. A lot of them were not actually allowed to the front lines or they were reluctant to put them on the front lines. Uh, I mean, to put them in positions where they have, where they are armed because they did not want to get into their head that you could shoot at the white man for, 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 uh, for fear of setting precedent. So what are, what are the First World War consequences on Africa? The first one, a very important one, is the removal of the invincibility myth. Now, of course, we've seen that there have been some successful battles here and there. We saw the Anglo-Zulu War. We saw some of the early resistances, some of the wins by the, by the uh, Abu Shiri revolt. But of course, they had not been sustained. So based on their military might and, and technological advancement, the Europeans were looking very unbeatable at this point. They're looking very invincible. Yet all of a sudden, Africans are involved in these wars where they see the Germans defeated, right? The Italians defeated, the Austro-Hungary empire defeated. And not only do they see it, as we just saw, millions of the Africans are involved in this. So they start to see that, uh, you know, maybe eventually, these Europeans can be defeated. And another important consequence of the First World War was prior to, to the First World War, a lot of the African interior was still rural, right? We saw that in North Africa for a long time uh, that had been urbanized early. We see that in West Africa and on, on the Swahili coast, there were big cities, but most of the interior was was rural, uh, but what we see is a sudden surge in urbanization as, you know, the, 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 the European countries are, are, the colonial governments are, start, are trying to develop ways in which they can move supplies and people up and down, uh, you know, quickly uh, with some efficiency. So they start to, to invest more in that. Um, trying to improve food production, trying to improve all these things, uh, as well as many of the Africans who came back from fighting in the war in Europe and other places were not keen to just go back to, to, to rural life. So they became part of the urban poor for the most part. Um, so which led to the growth of these urban areas and the growth of the urban cities. Another important thing was uh, the Treaty of Versailles which um, prior to it was, uh, you know, was, was one of the concluding things of the, of the World War was the, was the 14 points as outlined by, by Woodrow Wilson and, and, and his peers. And among them was the right to self-determination, okay? Even though they're not really meant for this to include Africans, um, the educated Africans, uh, for example, the you know we've spoken about the the ANC at the time, the Southern African Na Native National Congress of South Africa, and others seized on it and started to use it as a, as a as a rallying point for their own independence. That if you argue that these European countries must be must, must be self-determining and must be sovereign, how does that not apply to us, right? So, I mean. And of course, Germany lost its colonies. We already spoke about 
uh, German East Africa became became Tanganyika, which is a British colony. Uh, German Southwest Africa became Namibia. Um, you know, Togo became a, a, a French colony, right? Then, of course, the League of Nations is established as a result of the First World War, and Ethiopia it becomes the sole member of the League of Nations. And this will become important as well as the further we go in and we, we, we talk about the advent of the Second World War. So these are some of the major consequences of the First World War on the continent. And of course, in all this, we cannot downplay the major consequences, which are the deaths of, hundred, of, ten, of hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Africans, the loss of life and the destruction was also immense of the Africans. So that's another consequence that I did not list here, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's something to, to be taken lightly, right? So the Africans were very much involved in the World War. The World War was fought on African territory. The World War was financed and, and furnished by African uh, resources. And the World War was, the First World War was fought significantly by Africans as well. So what are our key takeaways from today? What are our key takeaways from today? The first one that I, you know, the first thing to remember are the four types of colonialism. The four types of colonial rule, um, which are company rule, direct rule, indirect rule, and settler colonialism. The second thing to think about is who the personality that owned the Congo Free State, what was the main raw material, and what led to the decline of King Leopold's rule. Right. Main export out of the Gold Coast, and just think about the ways in which I described that this represented African initiatives. Uh, think about two prominent anti-German colonial, anti colonialism wars we just spoke about. And importantly, in what ways, three or four ways were the Africans involved in the First World War? And name three consequences of the war on Africa. That is it for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoyed the video, like it, share it. And if you're enjoying the channel, subscribe. We will be back next week as we talk about more um, resistance to colonialism in the 20th century. I look forward to seeing you guys soon and stay well.